Hi everyone, we're trying this again um, due to technical difficulties. Uh, one of the many challenges of taking over and co-owning a bookstore in the time of COVID is learning how to do things like live events. Um, I know how to shell a book, I know how to sell a book, and I know how to read a book, but talking about a book virtually is uh, a little bit trickier for me. Um, Catherine, does it seem like we're all good? Okay, great. Well, I'm going to give people a few more minutes to try and find our new link. Um, in the meantime, I'll tell you a bit about Pilsen Community Books. Um, we are newly a worker-owned and operated bookstore in the heart of the beloved neighborhood of Pilsen in Chicago. The store itself has been around for about four years, um, but my colleagues Catherine Solheim and Tom Flynn and I took it over in March. Um, just right before all of this happened. But we're glad to be here, and we're glad to be with our friends from Two Lines Press and Yasmina and Eula to celebrate um, the book tonight. So with that, I will get started with an introduction. No one wants to hear me talk anyway, but I'll get all this out of the way so we can get to the, the good reading part. Um, so I'm so excited that you guys could join us tonight to celebrate this very special book on Lighthouses, translated by Christina McSweeney, and it's out today from the legendary Two Lines Press. Um, one of my favorite authors, Veronica Gerber Bisecchi, described the book as such. Like a bower bird constructing its nest, Yasmina Barrera collects micro-histories about the hypnotic, geometric light emitted by lighthouses. But when she finds and listens to these histories in the dark intervals, she is a bat hanging upside down in the Tower of Memory. On Lighthouses has been praised everywhere from the Paris Review, where it was called A Light at the End of the Tunnel, showing us places we'll see and things we'll do when we can go out again, to Harper's. And the most exciting to me personally is that it's an indie next pick for May, which means it's a favorite of the very best readers around, booksellers. And speaking of booksellers, I'd like to mention that the Center for the Art of Translation and Two Lines Press are currently in the middle of their spring fundraiser, and 50% of all contributions are going straight to Bink, the Book Industry Charitable Foundation, which will help booksellers affected by the COVID-19 crisis. And we're going to drop a link in the chat to where you can donate, and I highly encourage you to donate to support writers and translators and booksellers. And just a few notes about how this evening will go. Now that you're all here, thanks for finding us. Um, first, Yasmina will read a bit from the wonderful On Lighthouses. And then Yasmina and Eula will discuss a bit about the book and their work. Uh, Yasmina was invited to join Eula Biss at the Centro Cultural Alana Garo in Mexico, Mexico City for a conversation moderated by Petronella Zetterland as part of the Lit and Luz Festival earlier this year. And that festival is produced by Make Literary Productions. And tonight is uh, going to be an extension of this discussion, and I'm really excited to hear it. And then at the end of the discussion, we will be taking a few questions from the audience in the chat. So feel free to drop one or two in, and we'll get to as many as we can. And so now, without further ado, we'd like to introduce Yasmina. Yasmina Barrera was born in Mexico City in 1988. She was a fellow at the Foundation for Mexican Letters. Her book of essays, Foreign Body, was awarded the Latin American Voices Prize from Literal Publishing in 2013. She has published her work in various print and digital media, such as Nexos, Este País, Vice, El Matizante, Letras Libres, and Tierra Adentro. She has a master's degree in creative writing in Spanish from New York University, which she completed with the support of a Fulbright grant. She was a grantee of the Young Creators Program at Fonca, and she is editor and co-founder of Ed 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 Ediciones Antilope. I'm sorry, Yasmina, that I, you can correct me. <laughs> Um, she lives in Mexico City. Um, so now, uh, take it away, Yasmina. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And before I read a bit, I just wanted to thank, first of all, uh, Pilsen Community Books for having us in your cyberspace. <laughs> and, uh, um, I so wish I could be there, but maybe in the near future I will be able. And also, I wanted to thank um, Christina McSweeney, who's the translator of this book. She's just a brilliant writer, and um, she's done wonders with this 
book. And uh, I also wanted to thank everyone at Two Lines for the wonderful work they do. And um, I, I also wish I could be there celebrating with you guys, but maybe we'll be able to do it soon. And um, yeah, so I will read a little bit. Uh, this is a fragmentary book, so I'm going to read a fragment that is from almost the beginning, although not the exact beginning. And it says, I live on an island on the fifth floor of a red building. The plaque in the hallway says it's the fifth, but for reasons no one has been able to explain to me, there are two second floors. I, re I re rarely leave this brick tower. When I do, it's almost always at night or to visit lighthouses. There are four windows, two have bars that were installed a while ago when a burglar managed to get into the neighboring apartment. The other window look out onto a brick wall a meter away. That wall is so high looking up, you can see the sky and neither can you see the ground below. The gap narrows and the bricks are lost in darkness. I've never suffered from claustrophobia, but I sometimes feel an uncontainable need to see the horizon. In this city of tall buildings, that horizon is difficult to find. In order to see anything at any distance, you have to go up to a roof, to the river, or to one of the streets that cut across the whole island. From time to time, I do one of those things. When I was taking art classes, I learned that my mind often follows the lead of my eyes, and if I restrict my gaze for too long, my thoughts become myopic. Another problem with the apartment is the darkness. In my bedroom and in the living room, a gray, muted, cloudy daylight filters through the windows. The only plant I've had here died after only a few weeks. I spend the whole day bathed in artificial light, and to see the sun, if the sky outside is clear and there's no one else home, I have to press myself up against the bars of the other window and search it out above the buildings. I wonder what will become of me spending so much time without direct sunlight. I wonder if I'll turn into one of those blind, transparent fish that live in, in subterranean rivers and caves. It feels as if my nerves are a little more sensitive than the norm. I faint at the prick of a needle. Almost all strong emotions give me a headache. Perhaps it's that I'm not thick-skinned and people seem a permanent source of danger. Pain has this ability to become stronger when you think about it. If I concentrate hard on a part of my body, it ends up hurting. If I concentrate hard on myself, I hurt. For instance, right now, as I write, as I write this. By contrast, when I visit lighthouses, when I read or write about lighthouses, I leave myself behind. Some people like gazing into wells. That gives me vertigo. But with lighthouses, I stop thinking about myself. I move through space to remote places. I also move through time toward a past that I'm aware I idealize when solitude was easier. And in moving back in time, I distance myself from the tastes of my own age, when lighthouses are linked with unfashionable adjectives like romantic and sublime. It's difficult to talk about the topics generally associated with lighthouses. Solitude, madness. Those of us who try have no option but to accept ourselves as quaint. If I focus my attention on myself, the pain is magnified. On the other hand, when I think of myself in relation to a lighthouse, I feel brand new and so tiny that I almost vanish. What I feel for lighthouses is a complete opposite of passion, or at least it's a passion for anesthesia, an algesic addiction. I'd like to become a lighthouse, cold, unfeeling, solid, indifferent. When I see them, I sometimes have the sense that I really could turn to stone and enjoy the absolute peace of rock. I understand the objections to the desire to escape from the world. I know it can be an egotistic, arrogant desire. The attitude of someone looking down from above, from a tower. That's why I find lighthouses so attractive. They combine the disdain, that misanthropy, 
with the task of guiding, helping, rescuing others. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that was so lovely. Thank you so much. That's one of my favorite I passages. <laughs> I feel like you're kind of describing a Chicago apartment in that uh, one passage with the, with the no windows um, that always resonates with me. Um, thank you. I'm, it's so nice to see that so many of you have found us here at this new link, and I'm, I'm so excited for this discussion. And before I turn it over, I want to give an introduction for Eula. Um, Eula Biss is the author of four books, Having and Being Had on Immunity and Inoculation, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction, Notes from No Man's Land, American Essays, which is a winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism, and a collection of poetry, The Balloonists. Her work has been supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Howard Foundation Fellowship, an NA NEA Literature Fellowship, and a Jaffe Writers Award. She holds a BA in nonfiction writing from Hampshire College and an MFA in nonfiction writing from the University of Iowa. Her essays have recently appeared in the Best American Non-Required Reading and the Touchstone Anthology of Contemporary Nonfiction, as well as in The Believer, Gulf Coast, Denver Quarterly, Third Coast, Third Coast and Harper's. And Eula Biss and John Bresland are the Chicago-based band, S-T-E-T -E Everything. Um, okay, so I'll turn it over to you both, and I'll put you both on the screen. Hi, Eula. <laughs> oh, thank you. Hello, and happy publication day to you, Yasmina. <laughs> this is just such a gorgeous book, and I feel so delighted that it's available in English. Um, we're, we're lucky to have it in English as well as Spanish. Um, and I have so many things I'd love to talk with you about in this book. I, but I thought I'd begin with this moment that really fascinates me on page 104. Uh, you write, obsession is a form of mental collecting. And then you go on to talk about the traits that Walter Benjamin finds in the great collectors. Um, and among them is the desire to be guided by the objects themselves. And uh, that seemed to really speak to the way you were writing the book, um, letting the lighthouses guide you into various different terrains. But I wondered if you could just talk about that, about allowing yourself to be guided by the object itself. Yes. Um, so I wanted this book. Well, thank you, first of all. Thank you so much, Yola. I'm so happy to be here talking to you. And um, yeah, so I wanted to write this book as if I was doing a sort of like a cabinet of curiosities, like a cabinet of wonders. Um, so I wanted to collect um, everything about lighthouses from quotations, from literary quotations, from historical facts, from um, actual figures to images to metaphors. So um, I like that idea of having an heterogeneous uh, collection that showed um, different aspects of this one single object which I was fascinated um, about. And um, I was also thinking about the cabinets of wonders, when, which I I, um, I don't know if you know, but the idea of these collections from the Renaissance was that if you collected one specimen of everything in the world, then you would get to a fundamental truth about the world. <laughs> and then, so I thought that maybe I could try something like that with lighthouses, like trying to collect one specimen or many specimens of uh, different aspects uh, of them to see if I can get, I could get to a fundamental truth about them, which of course I, I didn't and I couldn't, but <laughs> I found many other truths in the way. Uh, yeah. Mm. Well, I was wondering, you also have this wonderful moment where you write about, um, you suggest that that maybe, oh, you say, it's perhaps true that I like lighthouses because I'm disoriented. Um, and when I read that, I wondered, that, that realization comes almost halfway through the book. So we've, we've already wandered all over the place with you by the time we get to that 
And it made me wonder whether in this book, the lighthouse is instead of serving to mark your location, it's helping you get more lost. Like, and, and maybe that's the, the project of an essay is to, instead of to find something is to get as lost as you possibly can. I, I'm, I would just love to hear you talk about your, your sense of what, what you're up to in an essay. Yeah, so uh, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a really um, disperse, is that a word in English? Like <laughs> disperse work, I mean, it, it goes from one topic to another and it wonders and it, um, it, it wanted to, to imitate that sense uh, of getting lost, but in, in both um, what terrifies me about getting lost and also what I love about getting lost and um, but I also like very much that idea of essays being um, I think it was um, Philip Lopez who said that essays were or for him essays were excursions ex ex excursions like um, is that a word <laughs> yeah. yes. like excursions of the of the mind yeah, yeah. So it's not, um, it's a way, it's a wandering way, a path of the mind and just um, walking, um, wandering with thoughts just for this, for the love of it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's not like you're going somewhere, but you're moving along and enjoying the, the journey. Yes. So... Yeah, I wanted it to be something like that. I love that quality of the book. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the the book is structured. Each essay is anchored by a lighthouse um, in in there in various places. There's lighthouses in Mexico, in New York, in France. Um, and sometimes the essays will begin with the lighthouse, sometimes the lighthouse is in the middle, sometimes there's a long journey before the lighthouse is arrived at. And I wondered if you could just talk about your process as a writer. I'm, I'm curious as a fellow writer, but also as a, as a teacher of writing, I would love to know more about your process and how you gather your materials around each one of these lighthouses. Yeah, so... Um this book started with a trip I did when I was like 20 years old. And um, it was a trip in the coast of Oregon in Newport. And I was going to visit a lighthouse and also reading To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. So that became um, a really important experience for me. And many years after that, I, I wanted to write about it. So I started uh, gathering my recollections and also doing research on lighthouses. And then they suddenly became this fascinating um, object and building and metaphor. And, um, and I became obsessed and I started not only reading about them, but also wanting to travel to them. So it became like a parallel process where I was traveling to lighthouses any any time that I got the chance, it, it was not like I had a lot of money, so I was just going to lighthouses. But if someone invited me to a place, uh, then I immediately looked for a lighthouse or something that resembled a lighthouse or that worked as a lighthouse. And um, so I was uh, doing the, that collector's work of, of quotations and books and uh, information, but also... Uh, writing about my travels and then the process of uh, organizing that information was a bit a bit chaotic mm -hmm. um, I, I was actually very lucky to stumble into this word processor I don't know if you know it that's called um, Scrivener I learned about it from you 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 told me about <laughs> <it in> Mexico. <laughs> I'm very excited to explore it <laughs> Yeah, it's been actually a blessing for me because you can work with um, fragments, which is what this book does, as if they were post-its. So you have the actual images of the fragments and you can move them around mm -hmm. in a very visual way. And um, 
so that really worked for me and the, so I I thought a lot about the order of the fragments and the way in which they um, they dialogued with each other and they uh, not only had similarities but contrasts uh, but I also really liked when um, when luck and chance made better decisions than I did. So sometimes mm -hmm. a fragment that just stumbled with another one had a really nice resonance and interaction. And so I just leave them there. <laughs> and um, and so, yeah, it was like playing with doing a, a, a montage or a collage in a way. Um, so, yeah, with that book, it worked like that. <laughs> And when you wrote those fragments, do, were you writing them all around a particular lighthouse? So you knew those fragments belonged in in the in an essay dedicated to that lighthouse, and you were moving them around, or were they fragments that could be anywhere in the book that would end up? You, do you know what I'm asking? Like, were you working in a single essay, or were you working across all these essays at the same time? Uh, yeah, so it was both, I guess. Like, <laughs> I. Uh, there were some fragments that I wrote specifically for a certain part of the book and that I knew that they had to go there. And then there were others that I wrote as separate objects. I, I actually thought a lot of the fragments as objects mm -hmm. and, um, and then I just try to find a place for them <laughs> or, mm -hmm. or see if they could have a place because many others were just left out. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, that's so interesting. Mandy, do we have time for one more question from me or is it time to transition? She says yes, okay, great. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the the metaphors that emerge around the lighthouse. It's such a rich metaphoric presence in this book and the metaphors shift constantly. It's, uh, you know, even just pages apart, there's some new metaphors emerge and I, I'd love to know more about your, your thinking around metaphor. I know. Um, I mean, it was, a, it was a research also in common places because, you know, lighthouses are used so much in everyday uh, speech. And so you say, oh, that's a lighthouse because it guides you towards something mm -hmm. or because it's luminous or... Um, but also it's a, it's a metaphor for solitude, for isolation, and, um, and it changes a lot also in time. I mean, I think recently, for me, the idea of a lighthouse and a lighthouse keeper with this pandemic has absolutely changed. <laughs> and, um, yeah. I, I was thinking about it a lot, and, and uh, I, that's actually what I, why I chose the fragment that I read because um, it seems so uh, so strange that lighthouse keepers have to isolate isolate themselves, um, separate themselves from the world in order to help people, to help uh, shipwrecks and um, sailors and who who are uh, lost or who. Um, have to be signaled that there is a specific dangerous place in the sea. Um, so they have this um, human, very human task at hand. And at the same time, they have to separate themselves from the world. And what we're doing right now is to separate ourselves from others, from society, in order to take care of people we love or people we don't know, but <laughs> still. Uh, so, yeah, it's constantly changing, and I, I love that about lighthouses. <laughs> I love that metaphor. It's, it's a great metaphor for quarantine. We're lighthouse keepers when we're in quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting to me about this book is I, I do associate lighthouses with solitude and isolation, um, but the book is so peopled. There are so many friends and relatives and all these relationships threaded throughout the book. Yeah, um, that also apparently happened to lighthouses. When I started reading about them, uh, it turns out that many of them lived with their families and um, like have a, 
or had a small community around the lighthouse, so they weren't as isolated as I thought they would be. <laughs> but yeah, this 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 book wanted to be about that precisely about um, the difficulty in dealing with with the world and with people and the the need to to separate yourself from them sometimes mm -hmm. precisely because you love them like that contradiction mm -hmm. is, yeah again what we're <laughs> dealing with right now yeah yeah uh thank you so much i think i should um give a moment for other people to ask questions if folks who are watching want to um step in sure uh we have a question someone would love to hear an elaboration on the influence of virginia wolf and the specter of the lighthouse into the lighthouse versus uh, your work, Yasmina. Yeah, so there's, uh, the first chapter is actually dedicated to Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, and to that trip I was uh, talking about. And uh, it's a book that is very dear to me. And um, there was a particular idea that I liked about it that I wanted to explore here, which was the impossibility of memory. Um, and the lighthouse as a metaphor to that, because the idea, which is maybe a little bit complicated to explain, is that once you're moving to the lighthouse, um, the movement toward the lighthouse is similar to desire, that once you get to it, um, you lose it, in a way. <laughs> and, um, and that that also has to do with memory, that you can never achieve the the feelings and the experience of the experience itself that you are moving with memory towards something but it's impossible to reach or something like that <laughs> yeah but virginia Woolf is one of my favorite writers of all times and um i think her work has influenced me in innumerable ways, not only with this, but with my idea of essays, with my idea of feminism, um, with yeah, all of my ideas in literature in general, I would say. Um, we have another question here. Um, someone says, you've spoken and written about the use of fragments as a compositional tool. Is there a more traditional narrative or compositional style you're consciously avoiding? If so, what drives you away from it? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I think um, with every book is different. But in this, case, in this case, I'm not sure that I was trying to avoid something. I always try to avoid um, pre... pre uh, what, what is the word? Like... Um, pre-composed, pre, yeah, pre-made, pre something like that. Um, Premeditated. Premeditated <laughs> ideas of genres. Um, so I don't like thinking I'm going to write an essay and essays have to be like this, or I'm going to write a uh, short story, so there has to be a beginning and a middle and an ending. Um, so I just think about literary projects and uh, see what, what, they asked me uh, to do, and I choose any literary tools at hand for the purpose of that particular project. Um, so in this case, for example, I, I was working with this book in several workshops, and many people told me, like, but this is is this an essay? Is this a short story? Is this a, like, make, make up your mind, you know? And uh, I think that's what I was trying to avoid the whole time. Yeah. Um, is there, is place or physical space always a point of origin in your writing? And if not, what are some other points of origin? So here it definitely was um, places and travels and um, geog geographic spaces like the sea, etc. But not always. Like for example, my next book was about. Um, I mean, there was a next book that 
I'm not going to ever publish <laughs> that was about uh, natural history museums. So that one had to do with places as well. Uh, but then the, the next book was about um, earthquakes and motherhood and um, what else? <laughs> like, um, so different things that are not necessarily linked to space. Um, and I'm also writing right now about travels. So I again have returned to space, but in relation to friendship, which is something that also happens in in this book, I think, in a, in a couple of, of chapters. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question, and then I'll go back to the ones in the chat. Um, I read your beautiful essay in uh, Make Magazine today, your letter to Eula, and I was wondering if, <laughs> if you both were familiar with each other's work before this before the events you did together? Um, or was it like a, a happy reason to discover one another's work? So in my case, it was definitely a discovery. I, I wasn't um, aware of Eula's work and it was like a, a perfect discovery for that time of, of the year and of my life, I would say, yeah. <laughs> It was a happy discovery for me as well. Um, I think make they're incredible matchmakers over there um, because they lightly described Yasmina's book and I thought it sounded interesting, but once I read it, I felt like incredible kinship with you as a writer and thought, oh, I really like the way her mind is moving on the page and you're very associative and very, I feel like I can sense you feeling your way through the work and so yes it was a new discovery for me but now I feel like oh this is a writer that I should have been aware of all along <laughs> me too thank you <laughs> you seem like both such natural conversation partners it's it's really lovely that they set you up <laughs> such a way um from the chat, we have a question. Uh, you speak of collage, Yasmina. Is there a visual artist that inspires your writing? Oh, a lot. Um, my mother is a painter, so I grew up um, like full of visual references, and uh, painting is a very important uh, art for me, and it's been, um, it's just like surrounded my life the whole time, and um living with my mother is like being in a, in an art history classroom the whole time. So yeah, I, I really, I really like learning about it and reading about it and, um, and even writing about it, although it's a bit difficult for me, but this last book that I just published in Spanish, uh, the one about earthquakes and motherhood, etc. It's also very particularly about painting and visual arts that have to do with um, with um, motherhood, specifically with childbirth and um, uh, breastfeeding and pregnancy. And yeah, so many, many different uh, artists are important for me. In the, in the case of On Lighthouses, for example, I talk about uh, Hopper, um, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Edward Hopper. And uh, also, what else? Some French painters that um, painted light lighthouses, but particularly Hopper. And um, yeah, so I could just go on forever talking about this. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, is there anything in the Spanish term for lighthouse that evokes a different kind of metaphor than the compound lighthouse in English? Um, in the name of lighthouses? I think so. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in Spanish, they're called faros, and it's a, it's a nice um, link to the history of lighthouses because, you know, the, the first uh, official lighthouse, although lighthouses had existed for since forever, the first official one was the one in Alexandria um, that was this very, very big lighthouse um, that had a, a huge fire at the top of it. And this is like, a, it's become like a phantom uh, in the history of literature and in the history of lighthouses. And uh, 
yeah, there's a lot to say about that particular lighthouse. So I, I like it. And um, I also like that it sounds uh, in Spanish, faros, um, similar to, to, what was the word? Um, but with, with other etymologies that have to do with light, although it's not a, not a true etymology. But yeah, so it's a, it's a nice word in Spanish too. Isn't the faro, isn't that closer to the Latin? Um, is, I think I'm re I learned this from your book and I think I'm remembering that when you go into the etymology, the Latin is very close to the Spanish word, but quite different from the English word. The Spanish word um, faro? Faro, yes. I, I learned this from you, so maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, I don't know, I don't think I understand. So the, the word uh, faro is close to the word, to what word in English? Well, no, oh, no, it's that the word faro is closer to the Latin for lighthouse oh. than... Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's it. And the to, to that origin of the faros from Alexandria. And uh, yeah, in 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 English, it's a more descriptive word, right? Yes, uh, yes, uh, yeah. But it's also very very beautiful, I think. Um, someone wants to know if you'd be willing to talk about the process of translating your work, and how much did you collaborate with Christina? And do you work between both languages while writing, or just in one? Um, no, I just wrote this one in Spanish and Christina, she's really like a wizard uh, with words. So she sent me the text with a lot of questions and a lot of suggestions. And I was just like, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, of course, just do that. <laughs> I was cheering her the whole time because she had such good ideas. And I did try to put my... my uh, small uh, like help in any way I could um, I'm very I feel very close to the English language because I studied English literature so so it to me it's a wonderful experience to read this book in in English and I I even thought at times that I liked it better or I I definitely thought that I liked it better <laughs> when I read it also because it feels fresh it was as if I was reading a book written by someone else uh, talking to me about things that I'm interested in. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was, it's been a wonderful experience. And Christina is uh, also a, a beautiful person. So all of the conversations about translation always uh, got somewhere different. And, um, um, yeah, so it's, it's sort of like a translational friendship or something like that, which I, I, I love, yeah. That's lovely. I think we have time for just one or two more. Um, and you, please feel free to interrupt me if I'm just going down the question line. Um, someone wants to know how you see the role of the lighthouse in managing the relationship between human civilization and the natural world. Big question. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting because lighthouses um, are supposed to be precisely a signal of civilization. No, you're in the sea and you see that light, and that's uh, the meaning of that light is that there's humans there, right? And um, so, but it's also like a like a place of coalition between nature and civilization because the lighthouses are built right at the edge, and also sometimes they are built with them materials of the place so they are built with rock and they are uh, uh, you know sometimes they are even only rocks because you see these very sophisticated lighthouses but there are also very uh, rustic ones that you see for example in Mexico in, in certain um, fishing communities that they just put one or two stones on top of each other and then a little fire at the top of it and that's a lighthouse um, and that is just rocks and fire so that's nature and of course then you get to think about uh, what does it mean um, that something is natural and that something is civilized uh, because everything we do is 
natural because we're animals. And um, but they yeah, then you can get going with this forever. <laughs> yeah. I think we have time for one last question, the traditional question. Uh, what are you both of you working on now for your next projects? <laughs> um, so I'm finishing, I think, <laughs> finishing a novel about uh, the friendship be between three women. And it's also a novel about um, embroidery, <laughs> yeah, because it's... Uh, um, the story of three adolescent girls that um, need to go to alphabetize, is that a word mm -hmm. in, in English? Yeah, to, to teach, to, to read and write in a community in Mexico and the, the story of that friendship. Um, and they learn to embroider in that community. So that's what I'm writing about. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know when it will be out, Yasmina? Do you, does it have a publication date yet? Not yet. <laughs> Especially with things right now, like it's all so uncertain. So maybe by the end of this year, maybe who knows? <laughs> <laughs> maybe longer. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to it. I just finished a book. I actually I made the very last changes right before our stay-at-home order started here in Chicago. So I sent the book out and then the whole world changed. I feel like it's a book like of another time, but uh, <laughs> it's a book about money. I was writing about class and capitalism and writing from the perspective of an artist within this economic system and thinking about what is worth something and what's not worth something under capitalism and these, um, little minor acts of resistance like making art itself seems like a minor act of resistance against capitalism to do something that is in in many areas worthless or at least um, doesn't produce very much money. Um, so that's this that's the book that's titled Having and Being Had and it should be out in September um, depending on what happens. <laughs> I need to read that right now. <laughs> I'll send it to you. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I want to thank you. I'll put you, all three of us, on this screen. I want to thank you both for joining us tonight. This was so lovely. And thanks to everyone, um, and you two especially, for uh, putting up with the technical difficulties as we learn to navigate this new, uh, this new landscape. And Yasmina, I am so excited that we get to celebrate with you. Um, and everyone, you can buy both Eula, Eula's many books and Yasmina's books on our website at pilsoncommunitybooks.com. And also bookshop.org is another, another great place to pick up, um, pick up their books. And yeah, do you guys have anything, any last words you'd like to say before? We sign up. I just want to clarify, Mandy. So anyone anywhere could order from Pills and Community Books. You're shipping all over at the moment. We are. Well, within the, the continental U.S., we are shipping all over. And then bookshop.org is another great place. Um, there's a lot of independent booksellers on there selling the books as well. Thank you Thank so much. You. I really enjoyed this. And I wish you, all, you both good luck with all of this. <laughs> yes. You likewise. This was just lovely. Thank you, Yasmina. And thank you so much to Pills and Community Books. I, I really appreciate you organizing this. Yeah, thank thank you, you so much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and to everyone watching, thank you. Good night. <laughs>